Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor. We're pleased to welcome Fadi Judah, joined in conversation this evening by Jessica Abogados. The chat is closed, uh, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Fadi's new collection, Tethered to Stars, as well as other titles from Literati Bookstore. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, of course, there is always links to purchase books in the description right below me. And if you'd like, if you're watching live, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature. And Jessica may ask some of those questions during her conversation with Fadi. Um, and as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com uh, for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan, uh, or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's poets in uh, reverse order that they'll be reading this evening. Fadi Judah has published five collections of poems, The Earth in the Attic, A Light, Text to Footnotes in the Order of Disappearance, and most recently Tethered to Stars. He's translated several collections of poetry from the Arabic and is the co-editor and co-founder of the Atel Adnan Poetry Prize. He was a winner of the Yale series of Younger Poets competition in 2007 and has received a Penn Award, a Banapal Times Literary Supplement Prize from the UK, the Griffin Poetry Prize and the Guggenheim Fellowship. He lives in Houston with his wife and kids where he practices internal medicine. And Jessica Abugadis, his debut collection, Strip, won the 2020 Atel Adnan Poetry Prize. She's a Kundaman Fellow and a graduate of the Antioch University Los Angeles MFA in Creative Writing Program. Born and raised in California by Palestinian immigrants, she now lives on Tongva land in Los Angeles. They can't hear you, but they can uh, certainly sense you uh, through the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Fadi Judah and Jessica Abigailis into your living rooms. Thank you. All right, so I guess that's me then. Uh, hi, everyone. This looks like a nice intimate group tonight. So we can just let this flow organically and see what comes of it. I'm going to be reading um, four or five poems from my first book, Strip. And this is the opening poem, Dinner Party. At the Chicago home of two of the film's well-to-do backers, Irish Catholics. There was talk of the baby their daughter had adopted from Uzbekistan, the trauma of not being held. There are not enough women in the orphanages to hold all the babies, so they put them in one crib. The night outside was black, and I felt the chill inside my womb. There was a closet to hang our coats. The director, absent from the table, is tense when his wife is on set. The hostess took our coats. They had a white dog, four feet tall, with a coat you could find on a Bergdorf floor. The Bulgarian washed vegetables barefoot. When we embraced, she smelled my perfume. Look how beautiful your woman is, a remark about my collarbones. There was talk about filmmaking in occupied Palestine. The trained fighters hired for security ran off leaving the actors in combat. They had to push the car through the desert. The meal was decadent and the hostess pleasant. There were collard greens, corn, a roast. The hostess said they wanted an American feast and Jack with his white beard and iridescent teeth at the head of the table. The Palestinian went out into the frost to smoke, stepped in the tundra dog shit. There was talk about gentrification of East Side Los Angeles, the finest sushi in Little Tokyo. The cinematographer requested roasted vegetables. A rhubarb pie was served. There was a large bowl of tropical fruit. The wooded suburbs of Chicago are so dark, you could die if a deer runs in front of your car. The house was recently remodeled. The Bulgarian actress, pretty without makeup. The director was off on a marital dilemma. 
All the actors had spouses. Instructions how to kiss, blocking, can make anyone fall in love. There was talk about the promise of the young director who sat beside me. There were three Palestinians, two Irish, the Bulgarian. The cinematographer was Chinese American. The 80 was white and gay. The house was so big I got lost in the powder room. It had been a tough night on set. The scene called for nudity. An intimacy coach was brought on set. The director is having marital problems. There aren't enough women to hold the babies. A letter arrived and I saw him smell it. We smoke and frost and step and shit. The Akita is angelic. There was talk about the rental market, a stucco Mediterranean true to the golden age of 1920s Hollywood. He's a promising young man who directs me. I am a decent woman. I have scandalized a few. Everyone fell silent. The rhubarb pie was served too hot. The hostess was pleasant. There was a coat room and a remark about my collarbones, a decadent American feast. The, the Palestinian fought off three men, or so he says. Being held is a trauma. One crib held all the babies in Uzbekistan. When we embraced, she smelled tropical. Nudity was called for. The Palestinian was humiliated. A car could kill you in the dark, not while your wife is on set, washed face and barefoot. It had been a tough night. We held hands the whole way up the cobbled path. Quote poem. In love with possibility, I'm having a hard time leaving my apartment. Our tallest buildings are made of irony. Call it agoraphobia, but I find nary a sane person out there in the mess of cars and billboards. Not on the bus benches where homeless vets sleep atop the faces of luxury real estate agents. It's Los Angeles and I'm high in the middle of the day again. Something lights up my screen, my God. Unbuttoned pants, the 24 hour diner, phone light illuminating the alleyways of the historic core, past discount t-shirt stores and prison barred jewelers. Who's selling? Who's buying? My love writes epigrams for tea bags. I write taglines and property descriptions for houses where I'll never afford to live. We forget we're rich, drinking in the faux vintage establishments. We forget we're poor until rent is due. Was there something I meant to say as the sun set over the loft? Meaning or not, there's always beauty. My God held a promise to my lips, waited for me to inhale, take him in, let him inside my head a while. Loneliness has made me a coward. My memories forget about me. The good ones have died or disappeared. I'm gonna read two more poems. The Blood Move. My heart has grown tired and bored about this party and is thinking a little about late night Chinese, a cigarette and calling you to hear the ringing go and go. And although it knows all of this is bad for its health, my heart is tired of role models, wants to let loose for you, but not around this crowd of do-gooders. The heart is unmoved by yoga and especially does not want to hear about Eckhart Tolle again. The heart isn't interested in a TED talk about vulnerability. The heart is the least vulnerable thing. The heart does what it wants and oh, it pities how it pities. The heart is the passenger, the driver, has gum, water bottles, and plastic puke bags in case you get sick. Taco Bell, the heart regrets to inform you, has closed. You will have to find some other way to soothe yourself. Squeeze and relax your chamber muscles all you want I'm in charge, says my daddy, Dom Hart. And in the event you pick up, the heart is mostly listening. And this is my last poem. Riding in a bus on the way to prison. Even Castaic has dull beauty, like a woman you've made love with a hundred times, taking her clothes off in a Motel 6, not even looking at you. This toilet seat is cold. I want to die. I love my misery. I give thanks to it. I don't want to go to an outlet store with your mother. In California, we grow grapes in the desert. Music keeps the time. At least the birds are not bored. It's all the same, dirty wing over nameless tree. I have never known meditation to make any person more tolerable to others. You must love your misery. You must feast upon it. I give orgasms to my misery. 
My misery is more beautiful when it smiles. I care about everything Western, the beach, BDSM, Japanese fashion. I don't want to drive through four hours of farmland. The exaltation of mediocrity is boring. My editor wants to tell me he met the woman who writes poems about shitting on her husband's chest. They seem like nice people. I am sure she is very nice. The lymphatic system and humiliation. These are life's simple pleasures. I have no solution to your problem. I quite like the mess of it. You could try elevating your legs, a personal supply of psilocybin on top of a canister of coffee beans. Don't warn the house guests, leave it all to fate. My fate is the melting snow on this stupid mountain. My fate is a tingling clitoris. I'm an ugly little bush on a hill by the highway, a bee buzzing, little warfare in my ear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. You know, I know, as she said, we are a small, intimate group, but um, uh, we, uh, Hayan Sharara and I were excited to uh, encounter Jessica's uh, manuscript for the Etel Adnan Prize, which is a, you know, prize for, for Arab Americans' first or second poetry um, collections. And we rely, obviously, on the um, gifted and brilliant uh, uh, younger writers, I'm not sure that I feel that old, but um, uh, to, to, to help us make it happen. And so uh, we're, I'm just grateful uh, that you chose us to, Jessica. So thank you. Now, um, I am going to uh, read... Um, from the new book. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem called uh, Dehiscence. It's a strange word, but as a doctor, um, it's, it describes uh, a wound um, uh, coming apart, a wound opening up uh, after beginning its healing or seemingly completed, completing its healing. Um, and so here we go. I didn't say goodbye to the kids. I knelt into my weeping until my heart broke me awake. My forehead touched the floor. If dream is memory, I was captured in a van, incarcerated. I was and wasn't a leader. The prison was a camp in the wilderness. Its warden was kind. Unkindness came from the rules, which came from behind desert mountains. I didn't say goodbye to my kids. We were watching a soccer game when it happened. My boyhood team is in a city that was steeped in shipping slaves, water under the bridge. Two of the goal scorers were Muslim, one Senegalese, the other a Turk, who, who would have us believe he's German. I forgot to say goodbye to the kids. I sobbed, shook, woke up with a dry face and a cloven heart, uttered the, wor the Arabic word for it. There's a world out there, people no less beautiful than you are. I lay down for an hour, less water with time, recalled the moment I no longer let my father touch me. No more his little boy. His tenderness wouldn't visit me the same again. I felt his acceptance, unaware he'd begun waiting for mine. It was after lunch, on the couch, he stroked my hair, neck, and forearm. It felt good, then I felt older. Slowly, I got up, walked away, his fingers trailing the air of my wake, both of us wordless. I didn't say goodbye to my kids. There's a world out there, people who don't ask me what I'm about to say. You're not time. I served with time and you're not it. The book is, um, uses um, uh, some astronomical or, you know, uh, or, or uh, signs or 
titles and the zodiacs as a, a prop to kind of allow me to um, journey uh, into voice or voices. So um, this one is under the um, uh, title of Leo, the horoscope. Um, and it's in, it's in dialogue. You know, uh, Jessica, I might, depending on the time, might ask you to, if you want to read, if you want me to read Descending and Rising, uh, I will read one line and you read the next. Not later, just, just yeah, just look in, into it and we'll see how time goes. Leo, do you think we'll ever get butterflies to lay eggs in our backyard after what I did to the caterpillars on the lemon tree? I think you inhaled some of the larvae on that tree and they got to your head. Or my gut, they matured, migrated up my esophagus, slid down into my lungs, secreting a cough reflex suppressant as the worms hung upside down like bats. My alveoli, their makeshift cocoons. You'd better extract that cough syrup soon. It'll be a sensation over the counter. The newly formed butterflies would gently ride my exhalations, but not all would survive the exodus. You probably wouldn't either. Your chest might explode or you might implode with asphyxiation. Maybe, and maybe the butterflies are vested in preserving their host. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Whenever you open your mouth, a butterfly enchants us. My wife is Aaliyah. Which one of us is speaking in that poem? I won't tell you. So um, there is a, a long poem I'll say to the end, um, but I'm going to read um, a poem called Un Unacknowledged Pollinators. Um, it's also a poem in conversation, in dialogue. I think there's a lot in, in Tether to Stars that is about creating or playing with voice in multiple capacities, whether it's a chorus or uh, narrative or um, uh, theater. Uh, uh, unacknowledged pollinators. If you were a star, you said, you'd be called forgive me, to which I smiled, you couldn't see me and said, or forgive me not. You said, beware of the Ides of March on days we're distant from bees and flowers. Not if the bees in the mouth don't sting, I said, and the air we move is a monk's in a meditative year. Are we the plants or the particles, the planets or the elements, you asked, and our touchless touching vector dependent sex and the honey mouth, are they the silences that waggle the tune on our foraging routes? When I say honey, I clarified, I'm asking you whose pollen you contain. We're no snowflake symmetry, yet to each pollen grain, its aperture, porous, culpate, blanketing the earth as crystals might, and light isn't refused. And when I say honey, you said, you grip my sweetness on your life, stigma and anthophile, and the soporific folded on its synchronous river that doesn't intend to dissect my paradise. I said, captive, my captive, we lost, and what did love gain? I haven't fallen from where I haven't been or exited what I did not enter. Seen or unseen, you said, you live in my mouth. I have an extra room. The children like it there, mead in it their stories and play-doh. As if a child is the cosmic dust that made me, 
and on the suffix, it's eyed, and within that child, a child, and within that, another. You want to do descending rising? I have to unmute you. Yeah, let me find it in here. Do you know what page it's on? 32. Thank you. Okay. Which do you want to start or follow? I'll follow. Okay. So this is descending rising, and it's also a play on the idea of, you know, when you ask somebody their um, uh, sign or zodiac, and there's a, you know, there's a descending sign and a rising sign and the moon sign and the sun sign and this and that and the house. And, the, and so I decided to also continue to play with this idea of essentially polyphony or multiplicity in our voices that are deeply affected by those closest to us, uh, whether individual or communities. So here we go. It wasn't you inside your carrier that I loved. You needed new sneakers, daily steps of health. I drew your image out to its source. It was lovely to have a Niçoise salad by the sea. The beaches were empty, the weather perfect. You said olive oil reserves the right to the shore. We wed stars to beget an alphabet. From bodies to souls and souls to corpses. You said the dead don't want to be brought back. I said I don't want to live forever alone. In our backyard, the jasmine won't let go of the rose bush. What can do without the thorns? Half stranger, which is your better half? I describe you well, and you veil me miracle. Like the back of my hand, your heart. Like the back of my heart, your hand. I drooled on your jaw. You weren't repulsed. My pillow was dry. You sucked on my chin. Memory cast a vote in our intuition. A consolation prize, no cancellation fee. Some nights from space, we saw Earth with the lit spots unlit. We did make hell a better place and wrote for future echoes each now becomes. Within one made of zeros and a zero made of ones. With light debris in our genome, we talked. About what? The water level rose. You said the building blocks can't quit themselves. I said, our lives are a form their lives take. To gestate in Delta. To gestate in Delta. Thank you. Yeah, that was beautiful. I liked hearing it with two voices. Yeah, same here. I've never liked the poem uh, more than I just did. <laughs> um, I'm going to read now a poem uh, called Blue Shift, and um, it is um, a poem. You know, the sound that the title plays on this notion of um, shift in the hospital and the blueness that comes with that sometimes, as well as the blue shift concept, which is one word in astronomy that has to do with measuring the, uh, the distance of a celestial object uh, from the color spectrum that they, um, uh, that they register on our devices, so to speak. Um, but the, the poem does rely uh, in, its, um, uh, in its mode uh, on a Feiruz song, on a Rahadne song, uh, um, uh, that you may, um, uh, you may recognize if you translate the words because they're included in here. Blue shift, but it is a sort of a doctor poem. Nightly a longing, no repression, some trigger released, snatches me after the passing of many years. For who, I haven't a clue, the beloved nameless beyond erasure, when among the unsleeping, 
a recrudescence for the longing to die better. A longing behind a longing. My illness is past a certain ecstasy in the thrill of betrayal. Nightly, a life lived in disremembering an interiority that walks me far in search of one whose end I write in my calligraphy, a stranger's end nightly snatches me. Not enough that she suffered in headlines while so many of our good hearts refuse to believe that they refuse to believe. Names I count and remove, or is this the suppression you intend? Someone you know is on the brink of suicide, of murder. Is it also not a national question? If my love's eyes are stone, memory will carve them still. To die better, I search my distances for Fedwa and Alyssa. They're doing well, thank you for asking. A consolation that doesn't outlive hope, a fatal disease we've made curable mostly here, and nightly longing exiles longing. Nightly, your strings ring me with friends who go on singing the hours, smoking the air, drinking unaware that I was from among them taken. And the names, all but one, disappear, if one's ever lucky in our century. Um, let's see. Mausoleum for a Scorpio is one of my favorite poems. I'm gonna, I'm not sure, I might skip it. Um, I'm gonna read some, uh, just since we are intimate, I'm gonna read some shorter pieces that are little, you know, Aquarius is one little, little ditties. Aquarius actually is a conversation with um, two previous poems of mine, one in the first book and one in the fourth book both titled Tea and Sage. Um, so Aquarius is my own little uh, trilogy saga. Um, For eight years, her parents tried and couldn't conceive. A Bedouin woman passing through, through spoke her prescription, sacrifice a white chicken together on a moonless night around no artificial light, then go to bed. An overwhelming majority of the chickens were brown. The entire quarter searched and found, and nine months later, the girl came out fair. Like her father, said the women. No, the daughter says, my complexion I got from the chicken. I actually uh, will read this uh, poem, also another one I like called Elegy for a Kaleidoscope. And, you know, it, it um, addresses this notion that as, as Arab Americans, we're in constant search of proof that we belong um, as Americans. And I find personally that notion um, uh, worth pushing back on. Um, one does not need to prove that they belong on this earth um, through historical means, in a sense. Um, because that's what we are when we are sitting behind closed doors. We, we all know that we belong equally on this earth anywhere. Um, so, so here's this poem. And it, is, it mixes a lot of you know, it's sort of like a pastiche uh, story uh, to the point where somebody asked me, I was like, well, is this a real story? But uh, here we go. Elegy for a kaleidoscope. We found her in Socorro, etched on a tombstone in a cemetery that's changed public and private boots and tarsals, and grateful to the music of frontiers between ebb and flow, we made her ours. 
that her life split the tail and head of two centuries. This we considered relevant to our current standing in an expanding globe and went on a search. A docudrama whose stack of letters turned podcast for the cochlear of small towns, lonesome households on terrains through a train's window. The Southwestern find is Arab, a poet without obituary, dug up on microfilm, an immigrant wife whose husband's life until now was the one well archived. They had two sons, no daughters, and our poet's best friend was the wife of a missionary, first dean of a college founded in Cairo. We adapted into film the letters the two wives had exchanged. Records showed that her elder son was a falafel king in Chicago, then a shawarma po'boy fusionist in NOLA. His daughter, a lawyer, litigated and won against Detroit's negligence of its workers, and in Los Angeles, she married a Black entrepreneur, but it hurt them when her uncle lobbied Congress that he was, as Jesus was, Caucasian for citizenship. By then, our poet, our fulcrum, was gone. In her Kareen mail, she'd left us a few poems. Her verse offered English little. The few good lines that endure spoke the usual wisdom in expired form. The spirit is a magus irregularly good. God is a fly you can't swat. A mosquito that doesn't need your blood to go on living, still it settles on your skin. And specks of the universe, when we touch the universe, we touch ourselves. Um, so I don't know, do I go on reading or is this a good time to chat or what do we do? I think we're right on time to begin the conversation if that works for you. Sure. Okay, there's, um, first of all, I wanna say there's so much love in the Q and A. Uh, Fadi's words are breathtaking, my favorite poet. Um, and we have some questions. If you have any questions, please use the Q and A. Um, button at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit them to us, and we will be sure to answer them. Um, so first of all, Fadi, congratulations on Tethered to Stars. I'm so honored and excited to be here with you launching it. Um, it's a beautiful book, and um, my questions kind of align with the order that you read your poems. So um, this book is dedicated to your family. And in your first book, your daughter appears as a little girl who wouldn't harm a spider. And in Tethered to Stars, she's a teen uh, driving the car home during a storm. Yeah. <laughs> How do your kids feel about appearing in your poems? And do you think of yourself as a family poet? <laughs> um, I mean, I think my kids uh, like it, but you know, some kids are not, the. Uh, they feel proud in their certain ways that I, um, find out later in the in the PBS feature last week that there was a, a shot of uh, Muna's uh, paintings in her room you know she's a painter so you know so I feel like I want to include them that I am not you know that these passing moments of uh, recognition or visibility are not that meaningful without them because they do inform my life whether for better and worse you know the struggles and you know one learns about as a parent, how one, and, you know, I know you're not a parent, but as a child, you know, in a sense, you have a window into parenthood and it's this failure <laughs> of parents, even in your best intentions. And, you know, we joke about it now, but in the sense it's, you know, you, you learn a lot about how hard love is. Um, and uh, maybe when we sit down to write, we, we uh, tend to think about, um, 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 how better we are on the page than in real life 
um, you know, in a sense. Do I think of myself as a family poet? No, um, I, I, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know what actually, I shouldn't say no, I just, I'm not sure that I know what a family poet is. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I do, I do, I was just saying to somebody today, a friend that I think one of the things that haven't been, I haven't heard like discussed about my work by anyone. So in a sense, you're bringing it up is this notion that I write in multiple registers and um, sometimes I see the world through um, the narrative, you know, ditty about Jack and Diane, like that Aquarius poem about the Bedouin woman and the chicken. And sometimes I see it through the eyes of the doctor. Uh, and then sometimes um, uh, it's just that other, I feel like more of the, um, uh, the child poet in me that wants to sing the high lyric, you know, through love or desire or, or elegy. Um, so I would add another modality to that as well. Um, something that I noticed throughout Heather to Stars was a kind of a return to nature. And there's a lot of imagery that you return to. Specifically, I wanted to point out um, the imagery of trees, which appears in Leo, uh, Gemini. Capricorn, House of Mercury, so many of these poems um, feature trees. And you mentioned Leo um, and your wife is a Leo. And I think of like the tree as symbolic of a mother. Uh, why do you think that you return to this image in Tethered to Stars? Um, you know, it, half jokingly, I would say um, I, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm an earth sign. Um, and um, you know, so, uh, uh, but in a sense, I, you know, Louise Gluck in, in, the, in the introduction to my first book wrote something of all the things that she wrote in the introduction, that's the one thing that stayed to me is that had it not been for graver concerns of, in, in, you know, in the world, like the doctor and me having been to refugee camps or having a Palestinian background and English and so forth, that I would be a nature poet. And I'm just, I don't, I, since I was a kid, I was just a, a dreamy eyed. I would stare at the clouds and, you know, and was fascinated by animals. And I don't have a green hand. Um, my relationship with nature is, uh, is uh, a submissive one. Um, uh, I'm just in awe of it all the time. And of course the science, the, 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 the science background I have, uh, allowed me to kind of imagine a, a, a conversation with nature through, you know, uh, through that. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, 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 the whole definition of civilization is for us to dominate nature, right? Um, uh, because that seemed that whenever we became aware of who we are, whenever the agricultural revolution hit our strides 10,000 years ago, it was about our relationship with nature ultimately. Um, and uh, I think that we, that's a part of uh, sort of the human gene or genome that we always um, have a, a more loving relationship with nature than, than the one civilization has turned us into. I wanted to point out too, I think it's in House of, I think it's in House of Mercury, the, the scene of the family having lunch and gardening. Yeah. Yeah, that poem and that image struck me as Palestinian because that's something that I do with my family. And to me, like that was, to me, that poem was speaking to the Palestinian experience in a way that Palestinians would understand that maybe others wouldn't view it that way. Uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to take away that experience from others in the world, but I do think that it is. Um, you know, it has a, it has its Palestinian flavor because I'm speaking it as a Palestinian. Um, and because um, the tenderness that say my parents would feel toward trees, especially in, in through the, um, their years of displacement uh, uh, is, is exceptional. Um, that it almost really 
sort of really is it's about their longing or their emotions or their grief or their whatever you want to call it reaching deep into the earth and connecting with trees thousands of miles away so a fig here is somehow speaking to a fig there and so forth um so there is that but but i am also mindful of i think a reality that um there are millions of people who are still so much more connected to earth than we are in our glorious, you know, imperial civilizational presence where, uh, you know, the trees are supposed to serve our beautiful yards uh, uh, as opposed to us serving the tree. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I get that. And um, there also seems to be a kind of a generational difference. My grandmother, who would probably be the same generation as your parents, she could not be more pleased that I have begun to care for trees at my own house, that mm. I have an apple tree and a grapevine and a fig and an olive. She is, she treats it and she talks to me about the trees as though it's the most serious thing I've done in my life. And, um, yeah, there's like a certain reverence in uh, Palestinian elders, I think, toward trees and nature in a, in a very tender way. Um, uh, yeah, and I think, I think that's also true because the, um, you know, that generation um, was severed from their own continuity and their own sort of organic development with their own life and what it might have become had it not been for the, the Palestinian dispossession and the Nakba. And so sometimes it is a way of, of you know, uh, healing, I suppose. Yeah, or a way to carry land. Where yeah, you... a way to carry land, sure. Um, um, now I was gonna say, somebody asked a question for you here that you should uh, you should answer. Oh, for me? Yeah. Oh. The question here for you. Oh yeah, Nan asks, um, Jessica, I appreciated in your first poem you read your near repetition of lines earlier in the poem toward the end, with resulting added layers of meaning. Does the structure of a poem emerge as you write, or do you start with a sense of structure? Uh, I will say that I never start with a sense of structure. I am more free and disorganized when I come to the page and the repetitions in that poem happened organically. I wrote it by hand for the first draft and uh, it went on and it had more and it ended up um, kind of condensing as I edited. Um, but I don't think that I ever write with um, thinking about form or thinking about structure. Thank you for the question. Um, okay. Is there time for another question? I think so. Okay, um, I'll just skip to my last question. Um, so in astrology, uh, both modern and ancient people look to the stars for guidance or insights into their personality or the future. And I've seen infographics that compare the anatomy of a tree to a human lung. Is this a cosmic fingerprint? Do you think that our lives are truly tethered to stars? Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like, we're not one of those, uh, I can say yes or no to, obviously. Um, I think that uh, the elements that make us carbon and calcium and whatnot, um, they, they came from the stars. Um, and that the earth we are in uh, is, is from this explosion of stars that, you know, and so, so we are in that bizarrely paradoxically uh, cosmic uh, size sense connected or tethered to the stars and also in the smallest sense in the molecular sense tethered to stars um, I find I always find it peculiar for example how in older um, whether 
Greek writing or Sufi, some Sufi mystical writing, their sense of not just the psychological, but the cosmic seems to speak a language of, um, uh, of the astronomical, as if somehow there is something inside the early mystics that was passed down as if they were witnesses to the Big Bang, the way they described their universe. Forget about the scandal of the sun revolving around the earth and not the other way around, but connecting to stars or to planets, to the constellations above, um, there is a language um, in, in which, uh, even if you say, oh, it's just poetic coincidence and there is a limitation of language and vocabulary, so things crisscross and you interpret them differently over the, the years. And, but there's just something about, I mean, for example, even the concept of vanishing in, in, in Sufi or mystical uh, treaties, um, the idea that you, your highest form of love with the divine is to achieve vanishing. Is that achieving vanishing, there is this concept, for example, in um, astrophysics called um, annihilation. And the annihilation happens when particle and antiparticle collide. They meet when are in, in, the, in the big soup of things, the particle and antiparticle collide. That's when annihilation actually happens, which is by definition, both particle and antiparticle lose their properties entirely in the collision. And that's exactly what vanishing is between man and God, between man and, divi and the divine between the human and the universe in the concept of where basically you lose your sense of the ana, of the I, of the self, right? And so uh, the concept of the black hole and wormholes and start thinking, oh, the parallels of the human mind always searching for something about heaven and hell, um, you know, getting out of one world into another as if we're always searching for a conduit to get us into another unimaginable universe or realm. So, so I do think that somehow, you know, we possess a memory that we cannot comprehend, that we can only express. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time maybe for, for one more question, Jessica. I know you skipped to your last question, but if you wanted to ask. Sure. Um, one more. I'll ask a topical question then. <laughs> um, Fadi, the pandemic appears in some of these poems. As a doctor, what was your relationship to poetry as the pandemic surged? Were you compelled to write about it while you were putting the finishing touches on this book? Did you ever hesitate? Um, I uh, was compelled to not compelled, but obviously it was it was present in in all our lives that some as I was putting some of the finishing touches, like the poem House of Mercury, it just happened, you know, and so I couldn't um, not include a mention to it. But I think I resisted trying to, you know, include poems about the pandemic. Um, you know, I don't have a problem. With what I'm with, with what I'm going to say as far as what others do, but I find kind of these um, modes of reflexes that we have culturally about major events to be something I'm not good at. I did, however, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, write a long poem that was published in the Los Angeles Review of Books called Corona Radiata, and and I I had known at the beginning of that pandemic. This was in March 2020. Maybe because I'm a physician, maybe because also I'm married to, you know, um, uh, quite a, a brilliant uh, 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 physician and clinical researcher who was involved with the vaccines um, and is. Um, so I, I felt like the conversation about the pandemic is, is a conversation really for us, not just about mortality, but also about, you know, when it becomes... It's a privileged conversation. I know this doesn't sound right to many people. And, and my reflex was to think of the decades of absolute misery from endemic diseases such as TB or malaria 
uh, or even malnutrition as a disease or hunger as a disease in so many parts of the world um, that we tend to not address as, as a pandemic that is in, in a sense part of what we call the nation state model and the civilizational advance, right? It's not that hunger and malnutrition don't happen because the sky stopped raining. It happens because a, a lot of uh, uh, the structural or the lack of infrastructure happen, has to do with the way nation states are set up, especially the weaker and, and, and poorer ones. And so I, I felt, you know, a bit that it was my my task to uh, uh, to sort of say something to that. And obviously, my experience with Doctors Without Borders is is somewhat, you know, in, influential there. Uh, but also as a you know as a Palestinian, um, yeah. Well. Um, that, that takes us to, to the top of the hour. Um, Fadi Judah, Jessica Abugadis, thank you so much for joining us at, at Homo Fluterati. Fadi, congrats on the publication and the launch of Tethered to Stars. Uh, we're so honored to host you. And Jessica, we're also so honored to host you as well. Of course, you can buy Tethered to Stars and Strip from Literati Bookstore. Um, the link in the chat, if you're watching on YouTube, there's links right below me in the description. But both. Uh, hope you both continue to stay safe and, and be well. Uh, hope to have you both in in the physical bookstore uh, for your next collections in, in the not too distant future. Uh, and to all of our viewers, we thank you for joining us and, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So take care everybody and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Bye all. <laughs>